Welcome to the last community of learners event of the year. And today we have um, what well, we began with Chesterton with Dr. Moore at the beginning of the year. And now we're going to end with Chesterton. So we figured we'll have a Chesterton book in uh, community of learners. So uh, jogging with G.K. Chesterton. This is the book. There are some in the back. Um, Dr. Robert Washington Bill uh, is a runner. You may see him run around often, uh, whether it's out on falling water trails or on Tuff Road or somewhere around here, through fields as well. Uh, he is also a lover of Chesterton, and, and this book represents one of his great passions. And uh, uh, Brian Shaw is a professor in art here, and as you know, uh, he's an illustrator of, of many books and, and unbelievably talented in his craft. And so they're they're uh, going to share with you on this collaborative work that they did. So, welcome them, please. Thanks, Jack. So, for those of you um, who have not yet met him, let me introduce to you Gilbert Keith Chesterton. Chesterton stands as one of modernity's greatest Christian thinkers. It's, it's difficult to uh, overstate the case. Um, and yet, at the heart of Chesterton's towering intellect, we discover a, a refreshing humility and humor. He said, angels can fly because they can take themselves lightly. And uh, even at 6'4", 300 pounds, Chesterton was always able to take himself lightly. Uh, he was filled with joy. He loved people. He celebrated life. Even his, his enemies uh, loved him, uh, his, his debating enemies. Uh, the aim in life is appreciation, Chesterton insisted. There is no point in not appreciating things, and there's no point in having more of them if you have less appreciation of them. He celebrated life, and, and he, he lived a childlike life of wonder. And so that is, is what Brian and I uh, hope to communicate through this book, is uh, the childlike wonder of, of Chesterton. If, if I were going to describe uh, the book in a nutshell, I'd say it's a, it's a set of meditations, illustrated meditations, uh, on contemplation and the beauty of God's created order as seen through the eyes of a jogger. And I, I should, runner makes it sound like I'm too fast. Uh, so I just always want to say that I'm, I'm a jogger. So let me give you um, a sample of one of the essays uh, and this is entitled, The Contemplative Runner. Yesterday, I found it difficult to justify the time it takes to run. The time required to hydrate, dress, stretch, run, shower, and dress again for the day can take up to over two hours. That shows you my pace is pretty slow. My mind was crowded with more urgent things that he was doing. The lawn needed mowing. Unopened emails stacked two feet deep stared at me from my computer monitor. Colleagues called for meetings. For a week, I had not spent any good time with my eight-year-old daughter. Important things to do screamed at me from every corner. Change the oil in your car. Write your mother. Catch up on the news. Spend some time with your wife. Finish your research project coming due. But I ran anyway. On about mile four, with thoughts and worries still crowding in, competing with the cadence crunching of gravel road under my feet, a speeding pickup truck flew by in too much of a hurry for anybody's good. Why are we all in such a, a hurry, I wondered. Hurry is not of the devil, remarked Carl Jung. It is the devil. Pascal declared, I have discovered that all human evil comes from this, man's being unable to sit still in a room. When confronted with the sickness of his society, Kierkegaard prescribed silence. And Chesterton offered a similar prognosis. Wonder depends on some return to simplicity and even to slowness. 
Yet, when we try to quiet our minds and souls, thoughts and worries cascade down, urgently screaming for our attention. As one of the characters in Chesterton's novel, Man Alive, moans, we're too busy to wake up. And that's why diversion is such an integral element of our culture. For as long as we are mildly distracted by some external stimulus, a good book or film or bad ones, it seems mostly, our thoughts lie low. Henry Nowlin suggests that our thoughts are like chimp chimpanzees in a banana tree. Dance in front of the tree and the monkeys watch you fixedly, but try to meditate quietly under the tree and the chimps instantly explode into jumping and jabbering. What we need then in our fast-paced culture are ways to disengage our minds without lobotomizing ourselves with cheap entertainment. We need some way to keep the monkeys quiet without expending our souls to entertain them ourselves. Sounds paradoxical, doesn't it? Is this possible to keep the car out of gear without totally shutting off the engine? And yet Chesterton understood the paradox perfectly. There would be less bustle in our epic if there were more activity. If people were simply walking or running, about. Our world would be more silent if it were more strenuous. And here's where run, running enters the picture. With scenery going by, yet with nowhere to really go yourself, with nothing you have to do, the mind is allowed to disengage and float freely in thought or in so allow Ryan and me to describe for you how we initially uh, jogged into this book project. When Kimberly and I taught at Taylor University before coming to Spring Arbor in 2001, uh, we were asked to team teach in a course on C.S. Lewis and Friends. And asked if I would teach the Chesterton section, I jumped at the opportunity, even though at that point I had only read his masterpiece orthodoxy. Before long, one of our colleagues at Taylor had introduced me to the American Chesterton Society and to its publication, Gilbert Magazine. And I really liked Gilbert. Uh, it's, it consists of, of essays of what I would call Christian cultural criticism. <laughs> essays that are designed to uh, raise important issues that Christians ought to be in conversation about and then promote uh, that sort of conversation. Well, Chesterton himself jousted as a journalist. He wrote in almost every conceivable genre, but mostly he wrote as a journalist, uh, and the essay was one of his main weapons. So uh, I decided I would submit some some articles to uh, Gilbert, and after a few of those were accepted, I had this idea for proposing uh, a regular column for them, one of their, their bi-monthly columns. And so I approached uh, the editor, uh, Dale Alquist, with the notion, and I wanna, I wanna describe for you how I came up with that idea for this column, which was titled Jogging with G.K. Chesterton, by reading a passage from Chesterton's autobiography. Okay, this was written shortly before his death. I think I became a sort of comic success by contrast. I had a notion that the real advice I could give to a young journalist, now that I am myself an old journalist, is simply this. To write an article for the Sporting Times and another for the Church Times and put them into the wrong envelopes. <laughs> that if the article were accepted, and were reasonably intelligent. All the sporting men would go about saying to each other, great mistake to suppose that it was a good talk case for us. Really brainy fellow says so. And the clergymen would go about saying to each other, rattling good writing on some of our religious papers. Very witty fellow. <laughs> this is perhaps a little faint and fantastic as a theory, but it is the only theory upon which I can explain my own undeserved survival in the journalistic squabble of Old Fleet Street. So I tried to take Chesterton seriously by combining two incongruent 
subjects and putting them in the wrong envelopes, as it were, jogging and G.K. Chesterton. Um, jogging, something, one of the few things that I knew much about since I've been jogging about 25 years by that point, but I've moved mainly through the Midwest on old farm roads. Uh, and the other G.K. Chesterton whose writings and thought I wanted to, to further explore. Uh, ironically, even though I'm sure if I had asked Chesterton at some point to go jogging with me, he would have refused. He, he really did not like fads. I did have one other thing in common with Chesterton. I began college as an art major. Uh, at age 19, Chesterton attended the Slave Art School in London. Um, In fact, uh, Chesterton was a fairly good caricature artist. He was good at uh, sketching. And um, so let me read you another quote from his autobiography, he, where he confesses, in the case of the choice of a trade, it was outrageously unjust that a man should succeed in becoming a journalist merely by failing to an artist. So I too confess that I succeeded, if I did succeed, at becoming a teacher and a pastor um, merely by failing to become an artist. So when it came time to think about putting the essays from the column in book form, I thought about asking Brian Shaw to illustrate. I knew that he had illustrated books before. I knew he was a great artist. And I was hoping that he could draw like I wanted to draw, but couldn't. Uh, and so as I turn it over to Brian to uh, describe some of um, the process of illustrating, uh, I just want to take a minute and, and tell you uh, what a wonderful experience it's been working with Brian. Brian is a professional high standard. He's a great artist, um, and, and yet he's just one collaborator, too, with patience and Christian love. Uh, so it's been, it's been great to, to team, uh, team work on this with So, Brian. Let me start with a couple of apologies. I've been fighting a cold all week, or allergies, I'm not sure which. And so if you see me hacking and wheezing through this presentation, you'll understand. Um, also, Dr. Moore Jumenville pointed out that I spelled his name wrong on the first title slide, so I missed the second L. That's the bane of an exist our existence as graphic designers. We don't do typos. And I should probably also state that I'm, I'm not going to attempt to do any of this in a British accent. <laughs> that just wouldn't work very well. Let me also say, though, that one of my favorite parts of um, working on this project was reading Dr. Moore Jumenville's work. Can I just call him Mojo from now on? Yes, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, it's a very worthwhile meditation. He, you know, he cares deeply about his writing and shows. And so to be part of a project like this that blended Chesterton's style along with contemporary themes, that was very appealing to me. So I'm gonna be jumping around quite a bit today. Kind of, kind of an eclectic presentation, uh, so bear with me. Hopefully there's a little bit of something for everybody in what we're presenting today. But I'm gonna actually step back a little bit further to say, you know, that look at the broader picture of Chesterton as an artist. He was an avid artist, maybe more of a sketch artist. Um, and so to show you some of his sketches here, and to quote from a book by Alzina, let me get her name correct. Alzina Dale, uh, wrote a book about the art of G.K. Chesterton, and she notes his lifelong preoccupation with visual art as a medium of, medium of expression. Secondly, she says there's his verbal art, and then finally, underneath both methods of artistic creation, there's this bedrock of moral purpose. And so all three aspects, she says, of his art, visual, verbal, and philosophical, are needed to understand and appreciate his artistry. I like how that was worded. 
the art of sketching uh, informed his writing then and his observations, and probably only a fraction of his drawings were actually published. I don't, I don't know. Um, but if you took art foundations, if you've ever taken an art class, you know drawing teaches us how to see. And let me repeat that again. Drawing teaches us how to see. And if you, you know, if you have again taken any kind of an art class before, you know one of the most fundamental elements is line. Line is um, used for composition. We talk about it uh, being used. We search for sensitive line. We search for meaningful line. And if we're dealing with the human figure, we talk about the gesture, which is trying to capture motion and emotion. So. Looking at the sketch on screen by Chesterton, I think you start to see that you know he's trying to use line in a way that is going to convey a story. Ideas, technique are coming together in a work of art. So for example, I'll get specific with this one piece. Um, the man in the front leaning forward, you see all that weight on one foot. That's, that's a tricky pose to, to recreate in a drawing. All the turned heads, the people in the crowd, you know, some of them were cocked to one side, some of them were turned just a little bit. That's that observation that Chesterton brings to really, again, enhance the, the idea. And then, of course, the man in the middle who's, you know, being targeted is actually kind of shrinking into himself. We've all felt that way. So Chesterton captures that feeling of sinking into ourselves. And Breaking it down into some of the fundamentals, we talked about actual line, implied line, looking at the way Chesterton moves our eye around the composition, it's almost circular, and then psychic line, where the eyes are pointing and directing our attention. So, art, the fundamental techniques, Chesterton was a master at that, and I think probably more so because he practiced, and he, he was avid in his uh, devotion to, to sketching and drawing. Also, looking at the big picture, um, in the late 19th century, Chesterton would have been aware of and maybe even influenced by realism and symbolism. These were two artistic movements that uh, were being developed at this time. Let me just kind of, again, point out a few notes about these two movements. They were both started in France. Um, a couple examples of realism by Homer and Courbet. The movement realism was basically rejecting the subjective and the emotional and concentrating more on the observable contemporary reality. So for the realist, nature um, was more important. Uh, they didn't overly romanticize it. Ordinary people were depicted and they were kind of shown the same dignity that used to be only reserved for kings and saints. So realism was this whole school of thought, philosophy. And then on the op opposite side of that was symbolism, kind of coming about at the same time. Came out of French literature and poetry. And you have examples of Paul Gauguin and Edvard Munch. We've seen some of these paintings before. And the symbolists were basically rejecting the everyday contemporary world, uh, which was obviously popular with the realists. And they were favoring, in instead, timeless myths. So they focused on things like the exotic, the spiritual, the otherworldly. Chesterton said, a work of art is like a prayer. He also wrote, every form of art has a soul of its own. It has a certain psychological effect, which differs from the impression produced by another kind. So again, I'm trying to bring this back to what Chesterton might have been thinking about. Chesterton's vision of the visual arts had a profound influence on him, a profound effect. And he had, and of course, then it had a profound effect on how I approached this project. Realism versus symbolism. Uh, I always kind of steer towards realism in my personal work. But I love symbolism in graphic design, and of course, in illustration. There's a lot of ways and room to, to blend the two. Of course, as I looked at the project, I'm thinking about line, gesture, of course, pen and ink was the media medium that made the most sense. So a little bit about my background. I, I have illustrated three children's books for uh, clients such as SeaWorld and the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, they all had you know, specific um, 
subject matter, and uh, of course my approach to, to those works would have kind of had them in mind with what the goals of the, the project were. But of course I love pen and ink, and I've always been involved, or I always use that as a, as a tool for my own personal sketching or, or finished drawings. Uh, in college I did a lot, I've done a lot of freelance illustration projects in pen and ink. Some of my more recent works were uh, some that I did during my sabbatical. I took my family over to England. We lived for uh, six months in a small fishing village in Cornwall. And uh, these were a couple of illustrations I did of that, that village. This was a local singing group. They sang sea shanties on Friday night. And they would be right in the harbor, and I did a little drawing of that. And the other one is a clip where I found these old photographs. It might be hard to see here, but found some old photographs of fishermen from the uh, 18th, 19th century and kind of weaved them into the clip. Uh, that was kind of one of the iconic images from the uh, from that area. So, you know, as we talk a little bit more about the book publishing process, I hope you start to see really what an incredible process it is. Starting with Robert's um, class that he taught at Taylor, and then ending up here with this creative manuscript about G.K. Chesterton that was in need of publication. So we're going to jump back and forth between the two of us and talk a little bit more about the specifics. Let me just add uh, to what Brian said and say something about um, uh, perception, because uh, so, so Brian's statement was uh, art is uh, drawing is about seeing, uh, and that's you, you could say um, that Chesterton is is really uh, in his writing he's about getting us to see, uh, and one of the I think the best books of interpretation of Chesterton is Hugh Kenner's Paradox in Chesterton, where he just says blankly that Chesterton was a contemplative. Uh, and, and what he means is that he was, he was able to perceive, not a mystic in the sense that he would mystify things, but that he would, he would see reality uh, in, a, in a very clear way and see the being behind the reality, capital B. Uh, and so he's trying to, to reproduce that and wake us up, as it were, in a lot of what he writes. Uh, when I taught the Chesterton class here back, um, I don't know, maybe about 10 years ago now or something, uh, I was surprised to find that, that undergraduates appreciated Chesterton's uh, fiction and said that it was like Monty Python. I mean, I just I never saw this sort of, um, that, that I didn't think that, that they would be able to, to grasp uh, the subtlety of this, of this humor. But they saw this as something really, it's almost like cutting edge, which surprised me. So he's, you know, he's writing back to the turn of the century. Uh, so I, I think then the project of trying to put down in essays some of the things that I was seeing, and then Brian trying to put down in pen and ink what, what the essays are saying. It's, just, it's, a, it's been an interesting process. Uh, the publishing end of it, I had known uh, Bob Trexler from the C.S. Lewis and Friends Colloquium, which is every other year down at Taylor University. Uh, and uh, he had, he, I, I was aware of his uh, press, uh, Wing Lion Press, um, and the kinds of things that he was doing. He would publish books that might not see print otherwise due to kind of market considerations. And so he did a lot on Lewis and McDonald, particularly. Here's um, C.S. Lewis views from Wake Forest. Uh, and uh, so it's essays. It's really difficult to get a book of essays published. But this has got, uh, if you know Lewis studies, this has got um, entries by Walter Hooper, James Como, and others. Um, and he also published this, C.S. Lewis, and Philosophy as a Way of Life uh, by Adam Bartman, which it, it's just such a special, specialized book that publisher is not going to uh, jump at that normally um, because of market considerations. Well, we had another consideration to think about, too, and that was the illustrations. We, we wanted a publisher to take the illustrations seriously, and we wanted to have some say so over what happened. And we knew that, um, that Robert Trexler uh, would, would do that. 
for it. So that's why we chose Conquering Lion Press. Uh, so the, the title, Jogging with D.K. Chesterton, the subtitle uh, on the book is not really what I wanted. I, I, I was never in doubt about the main title. I thought Jogging with G.K. Chesterton, that was the title of the column. I had talked to some people, and it was, it was a little bit humorous, you know, thinking of this, this big guy, uh, six foot four, 300 pounds, jogging. Um, but I, I, because the, the title was, was kind of quirky, I wanted the subtitle to say some things about what the, the book was really like. And so I had um, suggested Meditations on Contemplation, Creation, and Cultural Criticism. Um, and Bob Drexler would have nothing to do with that. <laughs> um, first, he said meditations is probably going to scare as many people off as it would attract, um, you know, because of this sort of that new age, um, you know, notion uh, of what, what meditation is. Uh, and then he wanted something spicier, so he came up with 65 earth-shaking expeditions. Um, and I just, I just had to say, okay, I guess you're trying to sell the book, and I'm not. So, uh, so I want to, I want to have Brian come up and uh, talk a little bit about the, the illustration and the process of the, um, the cover illustration. So yeah, the cover design is an interesting story. And if there's anyone here from Wing Lion Press, I apologize if I say anything offensive. Um, but from very, very early on, I did envision uh, G.K. Chesterton jogging. I mean, how humorous is that? Six foot four, 300 pounds. Uh, yeah, that's a natural. That's, that's very humorous. And of course, humor and symbolism were what we were going for as part of this book concept. Even though it's a serious contemplation of you know, spiritual issues, we were doing it with the typical G.K. Chesterton humor. So anyway, I did this illustration of G.K. Chesterton jogging using pen and ink. Um, the only place that really made sense to use it was on the cover. And uh, since I'm also a graphic designer, I put the illustration into a cover layout. And we sent that off to the, uh, to the publisher. I thought it turned out pretty nice. I mean, I used the, uh, the, daily, the daily news as a background. He wrote a lot of articles for the daily news. I uh, used a little strip of uh, pavement over on the side because you know we're always thinking about pounding the pavement and hitting the road when we were jogging. So um, anyway, Mojo sent the cover off to the publisher, and I don't know, within a week or so, we, we heard back. Robert kind of sheepishly emailed me and said, well, the publisher has their own graphic designer that they want to use to, uh, to design the cover. And you know what, this is a very common process in book publishing. So what did I say? No problem, you know, that's just the way it rolls. And so at some point, we saw their designer's cover. And without getting too animated up here, <laughs> uh, I'll just say that I did not design the cover on the left. And I've been a professional graphic designer and illustrator for 25 years. I teach both at the university level. I can find about five or six major problems with the, the design that, that they created. So um, again, you want to know what I had to tell Robert? This happens all the time. You know, I think he was feeling uh, like it was somehow his fault. I said, no, this happens all the time. I could fight it if I wanted, I suppose, but I just chose to let it go, live with it. So you start to hear that um, the book publishing process is, is a lot of that back and forth and then kind of you know, rolling with the, the flow of it. Uh, I'll let you decide which cover you like and you can tell me after the program here. We'll tell you not, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down kind of thing. All right, a little bit more about the, the illustration uh, process. There, I think there are over 30 illustrations in this book. It's a lot of work. Uh, I start by reading every essay, and that's where I start to generate visual ideas. Some were very clear, some were very evident once I read the, uh, the text, and others I would have to brainstorm and, and kind of do a lot of different sketching uh, tricks to, to get, come up with ideas. So a lot of sketching, a lot of research. I looked for photo reference or took my own or did my own sketches when I could. And then you just get to work. And so luckily, again, uh, Mojo gave me total creative license.
license. It was a pleasure to kind of work with him in that way because uh, it was very easy. Other times working with other publishers, they have a lot to say, or you know, the author has a lot to say, and you know, you're constantly making adjustments based on what they say. Uh, the process for me, for my illustrations, took about a year, but uh, we were joking when we put together our outline. We, we were, I was suggesting, well, maybe we could talk about deadlines, and Robert emailed me back. I never met any deadlines, so uh, I don't think I met mine either with the illustrations, so we kind of just rolled along. And Again, I wasn't working on it full time for a year, obviously, but the second thing I would say about the process is this term networking. Uh, as I listen to Robert describe the process of his journey, and I think about my own career path, you need others to help you along the way. That's what networking is, and, and uh, it can apply to our spiritual lives as well. And so maybe it's we, we need to get away from networking as being only a business term, because really it's a life term. We can use it to say on many different levels we're networking with other people. And so as we kind of go through the rest of this program contemplating some of Bojo's essays, that's just one more way that we can kind of allow ourselves to learn from somebody else. Brian, do you want to say something about symbolism and uh, sure. realism? Kind of just a yeah, yeah, before I move, we move on from this slide, I mean, this is a good sampling of quite a few different illustrations from the book. And you know, I just got done talking a minute ago about realism versus symbolism. So. Um, you know, a lamppost over in the bottom right-hand corner, obvious, that's dealing with the idea of realism to showcase whatever the essay was about, and yet um, the, the one at the top, top left would obviously be a lot of symbolism. Now, I would have to go back in and read the, uh, the, the essay, but do you remember which one that goes with? I can't remember <laughs> either. I can't either. But you know, why is there a sand coat crane, a, a muskrat, sword, right, with the shoe. So again, based on what Robert wrote, I would interpret that in maybe the way I felt most comfortable, and, and luckily Robert was uh, comfortable with most of them. And so, again, you can look at a sampling like this and easily tell which ones are dealing more with realism, which ones are dealing more with symbolism. For me as an artist, that it comes back to all the technical things of composition and line work and kind of capturing a, an emotion or, or whatever, so. Um. So, um, with these, uh, imagine, imagine my delight of, of being taken seriously so that someone actually read something that I wrote, but then, you know, that they would, they would take it to this other level. Um, and it, is, it, does, it provides uh, something, I think, really uh, powerful in, in the book it, and it, there's this, this other dimension of being able to, to sort of think about the picture and, and meditate on that, uh, as well as, as whatever I wrote. So uh, I want to do a, a sample from one of the essays. I'll read a, a selection from an essay, and uh, and then let Brian talk about the um, uh, let Brian talk about the illustration. Uh, this was uh, the title, Hope for the Coming Collapse. Uh, and it's, if, if the first essay, uh, The Contemplative Runner, that's, that's about sort of seeing and the, the, spiritual, the spiritual aspect of, of running, this might be a little bit more like cultural criticism. Uh, unless you observed carefully, you would not know that the trail I run was once a railroad line. The woods and fields look as though they always stood there, no tracks strike the path. But perhaps if you scan through the oaks, maples, and spruce alongside the path, you would spy small telegraph poles leaning at intervals like ancient wooden crosses. <laughs> Passing them, I sometimes feel as though I am running through the ruins of some collapsed civilization. Can you tell me, the president of Nicaragua asks the urbane Barker bluntly, and this is in Napoleon of Notting Hill, uh, Chesterton's first novel. In a world that is flagrant with the failures of civilization, what is there particularly immortal about yours? It's a question we ought to ask ourselves. What is particularly immortal about our civilization? Recently, my friend Dean Smith uh, gave me a book I did not have time to read. J. 
James Howard Kunstler's Along Emergency. I, I think it was right at the beginning of the semester. Uh, I like Kunstler's writing and I like Dean, so when I opened it up and I found the following Chesterton quote penned inside the, the cover, I felt I should at least leaf through it. And Dean wrote this quote, it isn't that they can't see the solution, it's that they can't see the problem. I was hooked after page two where I read, um, if I hope for anything in this book, it is that the American public will wake up from its sleepwalk and act to defend the project of civilization. Though Kunstler disavows any conspiracy theory, his thesis is no less bleak. He argues that the end of the world's cheap oil age is upon us, signaling the disintegration of American consumptive suburban life as we know it. Europe, with its mass transit and more concentrated populations, will fare much better. In a recent magazine by Joseph Pierce, um, in a, re a recent magazine interview, uh, Joseph Pierce made a similar point. As I've said on numerous occasions, the present system is ultimately unsustainable. So reading Kunstler's book reminded me of this paper I had written like 20 years earlier in seminary. And, and I had quoted uh, the then uh, Saudi petroleum minister, Yamani, who said, we want the present setup, economic setup, to continue as long as possible. In other words, those who control the resources are going to ride the horse till it drops. I was surprised to discover Kunstler agreeing with me, quote, those in control will not surrender to circumstance until it is simply no longer possible to carry on until after the horse collapses, meaning there is not likely to be any planning or preparation for change. Perhaps we are avoiding facing the coming collapse because we're so afraid. More likely we're blinded by our greed. History teaches that men and nations behave wisely, counseled Abba Eden, once they have exhausted all other alternatives. <laughs> Yet surprisingly, Kunstler was not completely pessimistic about the future of civilization. He suggests that American suburbia needs to be retrofitted, and now you can hear these sort of Wendell Berry uh, overtones that Chesterton agrees with. Uh, American suburbia needs to be retrofitted, quote, into the kind of mixed use, smaller scale, more fine grained, walkable, or should I say joggable, environments we will need to carry on daily life in the coming age of greatly reduced motoring. So those places to which we can jog might become our community. So Chesterton agrees. Um, here's, uh, here's something that uh, he wrote that sounds like it came right out of Kunstler's book. He was stuck in a cab in, in a London traffic jam. He began musing on the fall of civilization. Communications may break down, and men be forced to live where they are as best they can. That sounds a little Scottish. Um, then he continues. I think how probable, after all, is the prospect of a lapse into barbarism. Now, that doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? This is in an essay called Hope for the Collapse of Civilization. Um, he says, um, collapse offers some hope because by this broken road, Simplicity may return. Man has before now broken down in the elaborate labors of his empire and bureaucracy and big business and been content to fall to a simpler life. He has been content to picnic like a tramp in the ruin of his own palaces. We will not be downhearted. Our cities may also be deserted and our palaces in ruins and there may be a chance yet for humanity to become more human. So what a great image, that in breaking down, we're slowing down, and we're learning how to become more human. So Brian, I don't know if you want to say anything about the, about the sketch. I'll just be quick. I mean, how many of you have uh, walked or run the trail, the Falling Waters Trail? 
Uh, it's like Robert was saying. What do you notice? What do you observe? Kind of falling back into that tradition of realism. You know, I'm, we're lending dignity to the scene of something that is, you know, fairly mundane. But uh, it's a simple sketch showing the, the telegraph pole. Have you ever noticed if there's any glass insulators left on top? And people love to steal those. But uh, there may not be any anymore. But it's also about slowing down enough to look at what's on the side of the trail. You know, have you noticed what you don't notice? Um, so we're back to things like drawing teaches us to see, observation, contemplation, locally, in the world. I think these are great metaphors for the, the big picture that we're trying to get across in these essays. Let me show you another illustration of this comment on the uh, So this was uh, this was the essay was titled "Momento of Mori," uh, and and so it's this. I, I started off by saying I wanted to find I think um, some form of skull to uh, to put on my jogging shoe, right? And so "Momento Mori" is remember your mortality, and it's this spiritual practice in the Middle Ages. Uh, and you know, in, in the essay, I'm talking about how every jogger knows she or he's going to die. <laughs> If not on that particular run, you know, um, every year, you know, you're getting slower and you, know, you got a few more pounds and it hurts more. Um, but then there are these fun things like when, the, you know, when it's like really hot out in the, in the summer and you see the, the flowers of the field withering, you know, when you think of the Psalms or Isaiah, um, or the turkey vultures like are sort of smacking their lips as they're circling around you. Like, oh, he's going slower, this, this guy. You know? uh, or roadkill, you know? I mean, there's just all of these signs of our mortality that the psalmist says we're like a puff of wind. And it is like a blinded, more like a symbolism on this. Um, so I don't know what, 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 kind, what time we have now. Can we, we open up the. Okay, I'll just open up the QA, see if you've got any um, comments, thoughts, questions for Ryan or for me.
how long did you spend on each sketch? Well, it, it depends. I mean, I do pencil sketches first, and then I move to the pen and ink. And like I said, sometimes I would read the essay, and the idea would come quick. Sometimes I would spend hours, days, trying to think through what I would show. So uh, average time on each, and they're, they're small little illustrations. So I mean, the, the, the actual size is maybe eight by 10, or smaller, five by seven. Um, you know, so the hard work is the sketching and the thinking. The, the, the quick part is just throwing together the pen and ink. I know it doesn't sound like it should be, but uh, sometimes you have to redo them. I'm not answering your questions. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I would redo so much right now just looking 
back on, you know, that, I mean, I don't like the preface, uh, anyway. Um, but, you know, one of the things that, that was, one of the things that was nice was seeing the formatting. The formatting was, was a lot better than I anticipated. I thought, I mean, he dealt with um, uh, leading, so for instance, because he, he knew that this was important to us, he would leave a blank spot you know, and, and, and he didn't just run everything together. So the formatting was really good. Yeah, I, I felt terribly guilty for so off, so much of the time because I wanted to get it all done, you know, for Robert so that he could move forward and kind of push it. Of course, he was falling behind too, so it was, it was good. But, um, you know, it, it's true. And artists would say this all the time is that I can look at everything I've shown on the screen and find the flaws. So we're constantly wrestling with that, okay, is it good enough to hand off? And especially when you think of it being mass produced, uh, it's, it's a daunting kind of a feeling, but it's part of that professional world. Well, if you have questions, I think we'll be around for a few minutes. If anybody wants a copy, there's copies back here for uh, five bucks, which is cost.